Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome back to the first episode of Mile Higher Podcast for 2024. Cannot We're believe it. We're here. It's a new year. New year, new us, right? <laughs> That's how it goes. Totally new me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm reborn. Yes, that's that's how it works. You become reborn. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel the reborn. The clock strikes midnight and you're reborn. Okay, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was nice to get a little bit of time off to yes. disconnect mm -hmm. from the interwebs and spend time with our lovely daughter and our family. Yep. Very nice. Um, but we're so happy to be back with you guys, and we have a great year ahead. We have so many interesting episodes planned. We are so excited to jump into it today with a case that is very frustrating, um, but given very, the circumstances, yes. it does make a lot of sense that this is still an unsolved case technically. Yeah. Yep. Because like you said, the circumstances around it make it very difficult, very foggy and people have different opinions on this one. So I think you guys will be sort of split. I have a feeling I know which way you guys are going to lean for the most part, but I am definitely curious to hear all of your thoughts on this one. We're going to be talking about the disappearance of Dr. Sneha and Philip. Now, what's interesting about her case, what makes it so difficult, is she disappeared the day before 9-11, September 10th, 2001, which obviously made things much trickier. And to be clear, this is the last day that she is seen alive. Right. Because we have surveillance to surveillance footage or pictures to confirm that. But other than that, we have no idea what happened to her mm -mm. after this. But yeah, I think people are going to be split. So um, yeah, we have a lot to go over. Oh, hello to our producer, Janelle. How's it going? Hey, y'all. Welcome back. Happy to be here for another year. Yep, very exciting. We've also got some great guests coming this year, too. Yeah, we do. Some really interesting Pretty people. soon here too. Yeah, so look forward to that. Also, if you haven't yet seen our documentary, 530 Days, it is available for free on YouTube. Um, just go to the True Crime with Kendall Ray YouTube channel and it will be there for you to watch. And thank you so much to all of yes. you who have supported our doc and supported this family. It means so, so much to them. Um, it's on the unsolved murder of Jessica Easterly. Absolutely. And we appreciate all the feedback as well. All that's been received. Yes. And we're going to take all that going forward into our next one. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it was a huge project for us to take on. And obviously, we're a small production company. This was our second documentary. We're a team of five. And it was a very complicated case. So, yes, all of your feedback was super um, helpful and has is going to be applied to our next project, which we are starting on soon. And we're really We are already about. talking about it. So, yep. But anyway, let's get into this case. Let's do we it. Have a lot to go over. So Sneha Ann Philip was born on October 7th, 1969 in Kerala, India to her parents Ansu and Dr. Philip K. Philip. She had a brother named John and a brother named Ashwin. In 1973, when Sneha was just a child, she and her family moved from Kauchi, Kerala to the Albany, New York area. And eventually they relocated to the small town of Hopewell Junction, New York. And her father was a radiologist and her mother was a computer programmer. Sneha was every bit as intelligent as she was creative. She had a lot of interest in the arts. She loved writing, literature, poetry, and painting. She was truly beautiful inside and out. She was a very compassionate person who loved helping others. And Sneha had a great sense of humor. During her high school years, she studied at the all-girls Emma Willard School. And after graduation, she attended the prestigious John Hopkins University, where she started out majoring in writing seminars. But eventually, Sneha's plans changed. She decided she wanted to go to medical school, maybe to be an allergist. So obviously that is a big undertaking. But she had all the grades and background required to get into med school. So after she graduated John Hopkins in 1991, she was off to the Chicago Medical School. Now, this is where she met Ron Lieberman, a fellow Chicago med student who was a year behind her. And the two of them hit it off quickly. In fact, Ron said they were pretty much inseparable from the first day that they met. And they had a lot of mutual interests. Sneha was beautiful, goofy, and intelligent, everything Ron was looking for. And they were both creative types. 
Sneha was an artist and Ron was a guitarist. They began to date and Sneha took a year off her studies to travel around Italy. That way, she and Ron could graduate together. In 1999, they graduated and both landed internships in New York City. Ron as an ER intern at the Jacoby Medical Center in the Bronx and Sneha as an internal medicine intern at the Cabrini Medical Center in Manhattan, which is super cool. The couple moved into the East Village and life was good. The evenings that they both happened to be off were spent in jazz clubs or sushi restaurants. And the two of them had cats, Biga and Kali, and their place was close to Sneha's brother. And she loved spending time with him. They were very close. She and Ron ended up getting married in May of 2000, and they moved to a one-bedroom apartment in Battery City Park. The building was called Rector Place and was just a few blocks from the World Trade Center. So their new place was still in Manhattan, where Sneha worked, and Sneha really enjoyed working at Cabrini, at least for a little while. But things turned sour in the middle of 2001, and Sneha's life became turbulent. Those who worked with Sneha said she was good at what she did, but she had some personal issues that seemed to be spilling over in her professional life. Sneha was allegedly showing up late for work, a lot. She was also sent home sometimes from work because she didn't seem focused. One supervising doctor said they once sent Sneha home for being unfocused and unprepared for the day. Another time they sent her home because she showed up to work drunk. Cabrini informed her in May of 2001 that they would not be renewing her contract, which to interns basically means you're fired. They said this was because of tardiness and, quote, alcohol-related issues. However, Ron and her family dispute this. They say the real reason Sneha was let go was because of, quote, persistent racial and sexual bias at Cabrini and that Sneha was a whistleblower. However, Cabrini says they have no record of any sexual harassment complaints made by Sneha. Shortly after she was terminated, there was an incident while Sneha was out one night with some coworkers. Sneha claimed that one of the other interns groped her without consent and she punched him over it. She filed a criminal complaint against this intern. But the Manhattan DA's office investigated the claim and concluded that Sneha had made up the claim. So they actually arrested her and charged her with filing a false report, assault, trespassing, and harassment. The harassment charges also come from the night in question. The coworker told police that Sneha had trespassed at his apartment and showed up to tell his wife what he had allegedly done to her. The police offered to drop the charges if Sneha recanted her accusation, but she said no. So she spent one night in jail. She, Ron, and her family maintain that Sneha was telling the truth about this incident. According to the family, the whole thing led to a period of depression for Sneha, and she was using alcohol to self-medicate. She was later able to get a job at St. Vincent's Medical Center in Staten Island, but she had problems there as well. Sneha was required to complete substance abuse counseling as part of her employment there, but St. Vincent suspended her for not showing up to these sessions. According to a police report, Ron and Sneha were also having, quote, marital problems. These apparently stem from Sneha staying out all night with people Ron didn't know. Sneha would frequently spend the night out without calling Ron to tell him where she was or who she was with. She would frequently hang out at a few different lesbian bars nearby, and sometimes she would spend the night with women she had met there. But Ron says that, no, this is not what it looks like. He said that Sneha was not bisexual. She just liked lesbian bars because she wasn't worried about men hitting on her. And after like, the... Sorry. I feel like that's so relatable and actually so common because there's nothing worse than being at a club when you're not interested, especially when you're in a relationship and having to deal with that. So I, I totally get... There's just so much... There's way better vibes at gay and lesbian bars for sure. And after the groping incident, she was just a lot more comfortable hanging out at these lesbian bars than at the regular bars. As for spending the night with women she met, Ron says that this was innocent too. He said that Sneha would stay up with them for hours listening to music or talking or painting until they fell asleep. There was one particular time where she spent the night at an artist's place and came home the next morning covered in paint. Sneha just liked to see live music and grab a drink sometimes, and Ron was a musician, so he understood. Besides, both of them were independent people who worked very, very hard and were busy and sometimes had conflicting schedules. So if they wanted to go out, they could do so without one another. So Ron says while this might seem non-traditional to some, it doesn't mean that there was infidelity or any issues going on. They had a good marriage and this was working for them. The only issue that Ron did say that they had was that Sneha had sort of a habit of not calling him and telling him where she was, which, you know, that's understandable to get 
frustrated with. You can get concerned about your partner. But this was something that they were working on, and he didn't mind that she was going out. He just wanted to know where she was, of course. And we wanted to mention that at this time, Sneha didn't have a cell phone. This is 2001, so only Ron had a phone. They did have a landline in their apartment, and all of this is a bit confusing because there's some mixed reporting going on here. There are some uh, reports out there saying that she did have a cell phone. For the most part, it seems to be reported that she didn't. But anyway, this next incident allegedly happened about a week before Sneha's disappearance. According to NYPD detective Richard Stark, Sneha's brother John told him that he and Sneha had been in a fight when she disappeared. This is what Richard said John told him. The fight started on a night where Sneha was visiting his apartment that he shared with his girlfriend. The three of them had been drinking in the apartment, and at one point, John left to grab some more drinks for the three of them. And when he came back, he caught Sneha and his girlfriend having sex. He yelled at them and pulled the two off of each other, and Sneha went home, and they hadn't talked since. Now, again, keep in mind that we're not sure if this actually happened. And later on, John said that he never told Richard any of that. He said that the whole conversation never happened and that it was a fabrication. In fact, John said he never spoke to Richard at all. So, you know, it's a bit confusing here. Yeah, it's like, is the detective lying or... Which does happen, but it's rare. And like, why would the detective lie? Yeah. But I don't know. We just don't know. I do think there's... You know, and rightfully so, I think the family wants to protect Sneha's reputation and Mm -hmm. her memory and stuff. So I understand. Because there are so many people that will judge that. Exactly. So I understand why they're saying this, but. But we don't know if it's true. We don't. I mean, the detective literally could have lied. So there's no use really speculating on this too much. Yeah. I mean, there was definitely some issues with the NYPD back in the day. Oh, yeah. Major issues. So you never know. Still to this day, let's be honest. Guys, it is a new year, and that means it's a great time for a new wardrobe. If you're getting sick of the items in your closet, let me tell you, Stitch Fix is the move, especially if you're someone like me who does not enjoy shopping, does not enjoy keeping up with the trends. I just want the process easy, and Stitch Fix does that for me. I actually love Stitch Fix. I've been using it for years, paying for the subscription on my own, and I've gotten some of my favorite pieces from Stitch Fix. You can think of Stitch Fix as your style partner. Your stylist will learn about your tastes and collaborate with you on looks you love. And it couldn't be easier. All you have to do is answer a few questions about where you typically like to shop, what you like to wear, and your price range. And with your choices in mind and a wide range of sizes available, they'll find your perfect fit. And they've got you covered with over a thousand brands and styles. It's truly amazing. And the best part is, friends, you don't have to use the dressing room. I hate the dressing room. Oh my God, I've had so many traumatic experiences. You can try your pieces on at home before you buy them and then you keep what you love and just send back the rest. And they've made it easy because shipping, returns, and exchanges are always free and they even send you a little bag that you just stuff everything in, send it back in your mailbox. And there's no subscription required. You can simply order a refresh as needed or set it and forget it with regular seasonal fixes. You're in complete control. Personally, I have it set to come to me every couple of weeks because I love it so much. So try Stitch Fix today at stitchfix.com slash milehire and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash milehire for 25% off today. Stitchfix.com slash milehire. So anyway, this brings us to Monday, September 10th, 2001. That day, Sneha had the day off work, but she had one big thing scheduled that morning and that was a court appearance related to the charges that she was facing from that Springs incident. Sneha went to the hearing with Ron and pleaded not guilty, but that wasn't the end of it. According to the police report, Sneha and Ron had, quote, a big fight at the courthouse. The argument stemmed from Ron being upset that Sneha was, quote, abusing drugs and alcohol and was conducting bisexual acts. The fight allegedly ended with Sneha storming out of the courthouse without Ron, but again, Ron has denied that this fight ever happened, so we just aren't sure. And he says that the police just made the whole thing up, you know, so take that for what you will. But regardless, after the hearing, both Ron and Sneha made it back to their apartment. They had breakfast around 1030 a.m. and Sneha told Ron that she was going to get some cleaning done. In two days, Sneha's cousin Anyu was planning to come over for dinner. Ron left the apartment at 11 to go to work. He kissed Sneha goodbye and walked out of the door. 
but he forgot his keys, so he had to go back into the apartment where he got a kiss Sneha goodbye one last time, which of course he didn't know in that moment that it would be the last time. From 2 to 2.30, Sneha meditated, and then she signed on to Instant Messenger to chat with her mom, who was at work. And they chatted about Sneha's weekend. She and Ron had spent the past Saturday at a party where Ron played the guitar with his coworkers. It's important to note that Sneha seemed upbeat and excited about the future. She told her mother that she was ready to have kids. And she was so excited because she knew Ron was going to be an amazing father. Then they chatted about Sneha's plans for the upcoming week. She may have mentioned possibly going shopping at the mall in the World Trade Center that next morning. She also mentioned Windows on the World, the fine dining restaurant on the top two floors of the World Trade Center's North Tower. Sneha said she wanted to visit the restaurant sometime that week because one of her friends was having their wedding reception there in the spring. She signed off at 4 p.m. to run some errands, and then Sneha changed into a brown short sleeve dress. She put her hair up in a ponytail and threw on a pair of sandals. Her first stop was to drop off some dry cleaning before going shopping. At around 5.15 p.m., surveillance cameras in the apartment captured Sneha leaving the building alone, dressed in her brown dress and sandals. Just before 6 p.m., surveillance footage captured Sneha shopping at Century 21, a discount department store. This store was a few blocks from her apartment just past the World Trade Center. Sneha purchased bed linens, lingerie, and pantyhose. Records show that she made her purchase using her and Ron's shared American Express credit card. After she bought these items, she went to Century 21's shoe store, which was in the annex building next door. There, she bought three pairs of shoes at 7.18 p.m. That night, Ron arrived home from work close to midnight, but the apartment was empty. Ron figured Sneha was out late again. He was a little annoyed because Sneha was supposed to call him and tell him if she'd be staying out late. As we said, it was something they'd been working on. But Sneha hadn't called, so Ron decided to head to bed because he had work early the next morning which the next morning was September 11th, 2001. Ron woke up in bed alone. Sneha still hadn't come home from the prior night, and he figured she was staying at her brother's or her cousin's place since both were nearby. He was still a little annoyed that she hadn't called to tell him, but he figured he'd talk to her about it later. At 6.30 a.m., Ron left the apartment and made the 10-minute walk to the subway station. That's where he caught a train to the Bronx that would get him to Jacoby Medical Center in time for his 8 a.m. meeting. Meanwhile, as Ron was making his way to work, the rest of New York was doing the same. The apartment in Battery Park was just a 10-minute walk from the World Trade Center where thousands were descending upon its two towers. Businessmen in suits strode across the plaza, briefcases in hand, ready for another long day of work at the office. Accountants and insurance agents and secretaries sat down at paper-lined cubicles with post-it notes speckled computer monitors. Their cubicles were adorned with photos of spouses they'd kiss goodbye, or kids that they had sent off to school that morning. Baristas at the coffee shop inside the towers were working at warp speed as usual, slinging coffee for tired-eyed traders and maintenance workers and security guards. The windows on the world staff were busy too, you know, just another day, or so they thought. Vegetables needed slicing, placemats set, napkins delicately folded, and if they could sneak in a few minutes, they would watch as the sun rose over the city. Obviously, I mean, we were very young when when all this happened, but just looking at pictures of this restaurant, it looks like a truly stunning place to enjoy a meal. I mean, yeah. the view is the view was absolutely incredible. Yeah, it wouldn't be long before guests would start pouring in to eat breakfast on top of the world. Sneha Phillip might have been one of the thousands of people inside the Twin Towers that morning. She may have been at the mall, you know, for an early morning shopping trip. She may have been sitting down to eat at the Windows Restaurant. She may have been walking past the plaza, battling the crowds of people. On her way back home. But the truth is we don't know if Sneha was doing any of those things. In fact, we have no idea what she did after leaving Century 21 around 6 p.m. the day before. We can only guess where Sneha was at 846 on September 11, 2001, when a Boeing 767 slammed into the North Tower. I think to your point you just made, watching the clips of you know, that people captured the planes hitting the building. I mean, it's just, it goes from a totally normal, just another day in New York City to yeah. seemingly the the world's coming to an end. Yeah, and it was a beautiful day too. It was. It was. Like clear blue skies mm-hmm. and then boom, it was just. Yeah. Yeah, it's still insane looking at the clips after all these years. I've seen, I saw it, you know, happening live on TV. I, I 
have very clear memories, even though I was in second grade, I believe. Um, and it's it's just still, you know, watching these clips, even though I've seen them over and over again, it's still just so mind blowing to see it. So at 9 a.m. that morning, Ron Lieberman left his meeting. Someone told him that something was happening downtown, and he found his coworkers crowded around the TV, as so many people were, watching as United Flight 175 hurtled into the South Tower. And that's when it really turned from, you know, confusion and thinking that it may have been an accident to people realizing we were under attack. Yeah, I mean, what are the chances that two just no? I mean, there, hit the there was no yeah. question immediately. There's this famous clip of um, uh, Regis Philman and oh yeah, I believe it's Katie Couric. Maybe I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, reacting to it, and it's like as soon as they saw the second plane, they immediately knew like this is intentional. Yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe we can insert some of that if it's not copyrighted. It, it, it does not appear that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now remember, oh my God, oh my God. That looks like a second plane. Has just I did not see a plane go in. That, that just exploded. We I, just saw another plane coming did. in from the side. You did. I did. That was out of absolute Yes, and that's view. the second explosion. You could see the plane come in just from the right-hand side of the screen. So this looks like oh it is Lord. some sort of a concerted Deliberate. effort to attack the World Trade Center that is underway. Ron immediately tried to call his apartment's landline, and there was no answer. Sneha didn't have a cell phone, so he tried the home phone again. And again, all he got was the answering machine. So obviously he's panicking at that point, and he's leaving her multiple messages that morning and got no response. And then at 10.28 a.m., the North Tower collapsed. And this was just two blocks from Ron and Sneha's place. And of course, he was very worried at this point. He called her mom and her brother, but none of them had heard from Sneha. Ron was really worried but he had never really considered that she was in one of the towers. She didn't have any plans to be there that he knew of and not a whole lot of reason to be there in the first place. His fear stemmed from the fact that he hadn't seen his wife in over 24 hours at this point. He worried that maybe the night before she had been kidnapped or hit by a car. But obviously, given the attacks that morning, the staff at Jacoby were expecting a surge of critical patients. So Ron waited there. But this rush of patience never actually came. At 3 p.m., he asked his boss if he could leave early to find Sneha, and they agreed to let him go. He was able to get a ride in an ambulance, and the streets in lower Manhattan were obviously closed, but emergency vehicles could still make it through. Ron was able to make it as far as Tribeca before the ambulance just couldn't go any further. And from there, Ron used his medical credentials to get past the police blockade, and he started to walk back to his apartment. He walked through the suffocating ash and past burnt cars to Rector Place, praying that his wife was safe inside. Which that footage that's out there oh of my people. God. I mean, once the towers came down, just all of that yeah. toxic ash filled oh. the air. I mean, it the sky was dark, just like com yep. almost completely black. Yeah, it's it's truly it's terrifying. Like, it's yeah, it is. It's hard to even imagine being there. God. So you can just imagine Ron. Ugh. trying to make his way i mean through all of the just, just chaos people screaming and mm -hmm. sh you know shouting out for their loved ones and he's just trying to make his way back to his apartment hoping that his wife is there waiting for him yeah i'm sure i'm not the only one out there but we've all had an experience with a doctor that maybe wasn't uh the best thing right maybe we've had doctors we don't really vibe with and just they don't really listen to you and when you leave the office, you feel like, wow, I didn't get any help here. Well, enter ZocDoc, the place where you can find and book doctors who will make you feel comfortable and actually listen to you. I love ZocDoc because of the patient reviews. It's very important to look at reviews for pretty much anything. I'm a big reviews guy. I look at reviews before I literally go anywhere or pay for anything. And ZocDoc allows me to take a look at the doctors in my area who have available appointments and I can make a very educated decision on what doctor I want to see based on the patient reviews. A couple months ago, I did not have a doctor because I kind of moved to a new area. And so I went on ZocDoc and I was able to find a doctor who had an open appointment literally the next day or so. And I actually ended up really loving this particular doctor. And now he's my primary care physician. And it's all thanks to ZocDoc. 
ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book appointments with them online. Once you find the doc you want, you can book them immediately and there's no more waiting awkwardly on hold with a receptionist. And all of these docs on ZocDoc have verified reviews from actual real patients. We're talking about booking appointments with tens of thousands of top rated patient reviewed credible doctors and specialists. You can even filter specifically for ones that take your insurance or are located near you and treat basically any condition you're looking for. So it's not just primary care physicians, could be dermatologists, you name it, they will find a doctor for you. The typical wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between 24 to 72 hours. And sometimes you can even score same day appointments, which always comes in clutch when you need it most. Go to ZocDoc.com slash mile higher and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C, D-O-C.com slash mile higher. ZocDoc.com slash mile higher. But the problem was Ron couldn't get inside the building. The doors were powered by electricity and the electricity was out, so he couldn't open them. But he did spot someone with a candle burning in their window. Ron shined a flashlight into their window to get their attention. And when the person opened their window, Ron asked them to knock on their apartment door and check for his wife. They agreed, but when they came back, they told Ron that they knocked and there was no answer. Ron still couldn't get into the building, so he spent a sleepless night on a friend's couch. The next day, when he was finally able to get in, he couldn't find Sneha. She was not in the apartment. The apartment itself was full of dust and debris. They had left a window open the night before the attack, so all of that had piled in. There was no footprints in the dust indicating that Sneha had returned home. The only prints in the dust were the tiny paw prints of their cats. In fact, everything in the apartment was completely untouched. All of Sneha's things were right where she left them. So Ron reported Sneha missing that day, which at this point is September 12th. But it was clear that NYPD was obviously too overwhelmed to investigate her case. They lumped Sneha in with the thousands of people that were reported missing following the attacks. But Ron at the time wasn't thinking that Sneha's disappearance was related to the attacks. He tried to stress again that she went missing on the 10th, but they didn't seem inclined to help that much. And obviously they're very overwhelmed. Ron didn't know what to do other than to plaster missing persons posters all over the city and keep searching. It seems pretty evident based on what he found when he got back to the apartment that Sneha never returned to the apartment yep. on the 10th. Mm -hmm. And it, it is weird that all of her things were still in the apartment as well. Mm -hmm. Because if she had eventually come home on the 11th and then left again, you would have thought that she would have brought her things with her or there'd be some evidence that she had been there Something. again would have gotten yeah. his voicemails from or you know check the answering machine to see that ron had called and likely would have reached out to him but there's no evidence to suggest that she ever went back to the apartment nothing following the last time she was seen on the 10th so that that is very very weird reporters line the streets wanting to talk to those with loved ones missing and ron tried to get sneha's case attention by getting it on tv but as you can imagine, the reporters didn't want to cover the story when they heard she went missing on September 10th. They wanted to hear about people who went through the attacks. Ron didn't know what to do, so he called Sneha's brother John and told him the predicament. Ron thought that maybe John could go out there and talk about Sneha's disappearance and maybe just leave out a few details so that they would talk about her. But John was desperate to find his sister, so he took it a step further to make sure that the news would air a photo of her. On the street, he told a reporter that he had last talked to Sneha on the phone while the attacks took place. He said, quote, I was on the phone with her and she told me she couldn't leave because people were hurt. She said, I have to help this person and that's the last thing I heard from her. But this statement is a lie. John hadn't heard from Sneha in over a week because they were in a fight. But he wanted to find his sister more than anything and if many of us are in the situation, we'd probably do the same thing. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, would. we're desperate. To, yeah. to find our loved ones. So. And it's desperate times too. You yeah. know, it's like so, so unusual. We haven't experienced anything like this. So in that situation, I can totally see why he did that. Well, it worked. This trick worked. The news ran the story with a photo of Sneha, but sadly nothing ever really came of it. The police got no tips and there were no sightings of Sneha. Later on, John worried that this lie might have led police down the wrong path in their investigation. He wondered if it wrapped up her case in the NYPD's minds, making Sneha's case a more or less solved hero story rather than a missing persons case. 
Over 9,000 people were reported missing in New York City following the 9-11 attacks. Sneha was one of them, and missing posters for thousands of different people lined the streets, plastered on bus stops, lampposts, and storefront windows. In that sea of faces, there was Sneha with the numbers of Ron and her brother Ashwin listed if anyone had seen her. As the days went on, those thousands of cases were whittled down, and many people were able to get in touch with their lost loved ones. Sadly, thousands of people learned that their missing loved ones had been killed, but almost everyone, after a certain amount of time had passed, had answers. But Sneha's family didn't. Nobody had seen her. As the week went on, Ron received a phone call from a Century 21 sales clerk who recognized Sneha. The sales clerk worked in the shoe department and remembered Sneha shopping there on the 10th. But she said that day that Sneha had come to the store with a friend, and she described this friend as a small woman in her early 30s who was dark-skinned, possibly Indian. So for three weeks, Ron and the police poured over the Century 21 security footage. He did find footage of Sneha shopping alone in the main building, but the shoe department didn't have cameras. So it's not been confirmed whether or not Sneha was shopping with anyone else. And if she was, it's unknown who that person would be. As you remember, Sneha bought a few things from Century 21, so she did have bags from the store. The thing is, Ron didn't find those bags in the apartment. And to this day, the bags and the items inside have never been located. So this would seem to indicate that she didn't come home after she left the apartment on the 10th. And again, the lack of footprints in the dust when Ron got home showed that she didn't visit the apartment after the attacks either. The police were able to rule Ron out as a suspect, but beyond that, it didn't seem like they were going to investigate Sneha's case. They pretty much decided that she had been a casualty of 9-11. But Ron wasn't convinced. He and the Philip family hired a private investigator, and the PI scoured through security footage from Sneha's favorite places, as well as bars, restaurants, hotels, and shops near Century 21, and nothing turned up. He did try showing Sneha's photos to ferry operators in hopes that they would recognize her if she had left or been smuggled off the island on the 10th or the 11th, but nobody recognized her. However, the PI did find that around 4 a.m. on the 11th, someone called Ron's cell phone from his home phone. Ron said that he doesn't remember making the call, but he might have checked his messages that night while he was half asleep. They checked her phone records and didn't find any unusual contacts or call patterns in them. They also examined Sneha's computer and didn't find anything out of the ordinary. Sneha and her mom were very close, so she called her every day. But after that instant messaging conversation on the 10th, Sneha never contacted her mother again. Of course, the police looked over Sneha's financial records and they found that she did not make any transactions after she shopped at Century 21. They also found no evidence of any unusual transactions before her disappearance as well. Ron kept the American Express card open just in case there were any more transactions on it, but none were made. However, there is one possible piece of evidence that points to Sneha returning to her building, but maybe not the apartment itself. This came from the apartment building security cameras on September 11th at 8.43 a.m., so right before the attacks. Security footage showed a woman entering the Rector Place building. The sunlight, however, made the camera footage too bleached to see clearly, but this was just minutes before the plane hit. This woman did appear to be Sneha's shape and size. It looked like she was wearing a brown dress similar to the one that Sneha was wearing the day before, and she had a similar haircut. She also had mannerisms that were similar to Sneha's as well. In the footage, this woman enters the building, waits at the elevator for a minute or two, and then turns around and leaves. This woman was not carrying shopping bags. As time went on and they considered the evidence, both the police and Sneha's family believed that they finally had the truth, that Sneha had died on September 11, 2001 at the World Trade Center. They believed that she heard the chaos outside while she's, you know, waiting for the elevator, saw the burning tower, and ran to provide medical assistance. I mean, she is a doctor, and there were so many injured people. And tragically, they believe that maybe she died while trying to save others. This episode of Mile Higher is brought to you by Wild Grain. Wild Grain is the first ever bake from frozen subscription box for sourdough breads, fresh pastas, and artisanal pastries. Every item bakes from frozen in 25 minutes or less no thawing required. The team at Wild Grain sent us a box 
and there was so much delicious stuff inside, including pasta, pastries, and boy, do we love our sourdough bread. My favorite thing in the box was the croissants. I love myself a good croissant in the morning. And what I love about Wild Grain is that it doesn't have to take up room in your pantry. You can just throw it in your freezer. We have an extra freezer downstairs. So all of the Wild Grain stuff lives there. And I just pop them out from the freezer to the oven. And in 20, 30 minutes or so, I have fresh baked pastries. Absolutely delicious. I was really impressed at how good everything tasted despite being baked from frozen. And you can now fully customize your wild grain box so you can get any combination of breads, pastas, and pastries you like. If you want a box of all bread, all pasta, or just all pastries, you can have it. Plus for a limited time, you can get $30 off your first box plus free croissants in every box when you go to wildgrain.com slash milehire to start your subscription. You heard me, free croissants in every box and $30 off your first box when you go to wildgrain.com slash milehire. That's wildgrain.com slash milehire or you can use promo code milehire at checkout. Her family held a memorial service for her three days after the first anniversary of 9-11. As part of the small ceremony at the Phillips local church, they buried an urn filled with ashes from ground zero. The family frequently attended 9-11 memorial services as the years passed and the family found a community in the families of 9-11 victims. It was other people who they could process their grief with who were going through the same thing. Sneha was a hero, someone who died trying to save others that fateful day. That's how they would remember her. And in October of 2003, Ron filed a claim with the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. Sneha's claim, given her age and potential future earnings, was worth somewhere in the ballpark of 3 to $4 million. Ron wanted to use that money to create a memorial fund. But to make the claim, he first had to petition to have Sneha declared a victim of the September 11th attacks. A court-appointed surrogate guardian ad litem was appointed as a neutral party to speak on Sneha's behalf in her absence. The surrogate conducted their own investigation into Sneha's life to figure out the circumstances of her disappearance. This was because they needed to provide the court with evidence to prove that Sneha was at the World Trade Center when the attacks took place. Then the petition would be granted and Ron could claim the compensation fund money. But this led to another devastating blow to the family. The surrogate used the NYPD report to claim that there was no proof Sneha was at the World Trade Center on 9-11 or that she was even alive that day. This is despite the fact that the NYPD, including Detective Richard Stark, concluded Sneha had died in the attacks. In January 2004, the medical examiner's office took Sneha's name off the list of 9-11 victims. The medical examiner said this was because there was no evidence to show that Sneha was actually alive on 9-11. Sneha's family, as you can imagine, was completely devastated and they were angry that the court was implying Sneha was a reckless person who had gotten herself killed on the 10th. So this created a court battle that lasted for years. The victim's compensation fund closed during this time, so Ron couldn't collect on the claim no matter what the courts ruled, but he and the Phillips fought anyway. It was never about the money for them. It was to clear... Sneha's name. Finally, in 2008, a New York appellate court reversed the surrogate court's decision. The panel of judges said that there was clear and convincing testimony that showed Sneha died in or near the World Trade Center, and Sneha's name was officially re-added to the list of 9-11 victims. Sneha's name is listed on the 9-11 Ground Zero Memorial, and her name is located at the South Pool Panel S66. Now, Ron eventually did get remarried with Sneha's family's blessing, and he now lives with his wife and their child in California, where he works as a doctor. He is still on good terms with the Phillip family and keeps in regular contact with them. The family still ended up setting up a memorial fund in Sneha's name. The Sneha Phillip Memorial Fund provides free treatment for patients at the Santa Geary Clinic, Naraluva, Kerala. The Martoma Doctors Association and the Emma Willard School, which is Sneha's high school, also set up memorial funds in her name. Sneha's parents have not touched a room at their house in Hopewell Junction in many years. Everything is still just as they left it. Her artwork is framed all over the house, as is her medical degree. Each spring, her mother plants pansies in her honor because she always loved the blooms. God, it always breaks my heart hearing about families who keep victims' rooms exactly how they left it. I mean, it's so special, and I'm sure it's like a sanctuary for them, but it's so, God, it breaks my heart. I can't imagine passing by that room all the time. But there is one more thing that we're going to mention because a lot of people bring up a certain postcard 
when they talk about Sneha's case. And it's a postcard that was sent to the art project Post Secret in 2012. Now, a lot of you have probably heard of Post Secret. It's a pretty crazy website. If you don't know what it is, it's basically a big public art project where people send in their secrets written on postcards. They're supposed to be secrets that the person has never told anyone else. And the cards are sent without return addresses or names or anything like that. And the curator of the project then picks the cards to display online and in print books and exhibitions of this project. I wanted to show you guys some examples of these because they're pretty fascinating if you ever have free time and just want to go look. Um, it's pretty mind-blowing to read some of these. There's some crazy secrets out there. This one says, ever since I started having an affair, I totally understand why people hire hitmen or poison their spouses. E. This one says, soulmate, I love you, but I can't tell you I'm your psychologist. <laughs> hmm. Crazy. I'm sure that happens like all the time. Or the other way around, patients fall in love with their yeah, therapist. Probably. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know for sure that happens. So, big no, obviously. Big no. One of the biggest no's of all the no's <laughs> in that practice. <laughs> Here's one that says, I smoke weed because it makes me feel closer to God. Relatable. <laughs> I had a sex dream about Walter Matthew. This Walter Matthew, it was fantastic. I don't know what. I means. don't know. I don't know who Walter Matthew is. <laughs> I'm a 47 year old woman. Fortnite is helping me get through the most crippling depression. <laughs> hey, no judgment on phone games. No. Mm -mm. Well, I don't. Is Fortnite a phone game? Yeah, oh. there's a Fortnite mobile version. Yeah. Oh, also I totally phone. get that. I've been gaming. It's been helping my mental health. I told my dog that I am. Gay, I think that she is the only one that has not changed her opinion about me. Oh, oh, that's sweet. God, that's sad. What is wrong with people? I was kind of sick today, so I left work, but not so sick that it wasn't the best day all month. <laughs> <laughs> there's the also old saying, relatable. There's the old saying like, a sick day is better than having the best day at work, or whatever. <laughs> or like the saying of like, a bad day on the golf course is better than a good day at work. <laughs> <laughs> True that. <laughs> but anyway, the reason we're bringing this up is because there was an anonymous postcard sent in. And obviously, we have no idea if this is related to Sneha's case, but so many people point this out. So we wanted to at least mention it. It says, and it has a picture of the Twin Towers with giant smoke clouds around them. And it says, everyone who knew me before 9-11 believes I'm dead. So there's that. That could be anyone, though. There's yeah. no way to know. Totally. I'm sure a lot of people probably said things like that. Yeah. Or, you know. Or maybe there is something to it. Who knows? Yeah. Or or I was just saying, like, I'm sure there there could be people that have staged their disappearance around that time. True. But could how would be. you have known that that would have happened, though? There's no. And that's like the thing I come back to with this this particular case is when thinking about the theories outside of Sneha died as a result of the attacks, mm -hmm. how would it, like, the first thing that I think would come to mind is Ron had something to do with her disappearance based on the investigation done by the, by the NYPD. And they, you know, the surrogate found through their investigation that there was no proof that she was alive um, beyond the 10th. So is it possible that Ron did something? Like, just thinking about that possibility for a second ron i i know they the police did you know did their investigation of ron and they cleared him but you're just playing devil's advocate here yeah playing devil's advocate here because I, I think you don't feel this way no, no no i'm just saying that thinking about this theory of did they had marital problems they deny it but in cases where the husband or significant other murders their their partner there's always things like this like, that come out like, oh, no, mm -hmm. we weren't having problems, but that's not actually what's going on. Mm -hmm. So my thing with that theory is that how would he have known that 9-11 was going to happen and be able to use that? Or was yeah. that a convenient coincidence that happened? Yeah. Because I get some might make the argument, well, Ron went and tried to make file that claim for two to three million dollars and fight for her to be a victim of 9-11 and therefore there's you know is that motive but how would he have known that that was even going to be a thing if he made her disappear on the 10th 
unless something mm-hmm. happened after the tent that we don't know about and she's I know, just never been found. But I know a lot of people have that theory. It just it makes no sense to me. Do, I mean, do you do you believe does any part of you believe that? Well, I think it's it's hard because I don't know that the a real investigation occurred here. I think with everything going on, who knows the extent we don't have like the we weren't able to get the police reports. We don't know the extent at which they actually investigated this this disappearance. Mm-hmm. And there are circum there are circumstances in other cases where something like this happens, and it's just kind of a coincidence that something happens that pulls attention away from yes the actual case itself, and mm-hmm. therefore it kind of creates this disguise for the individual who's actually responsible for that person's disappearance or death to kind of blame it on this this bigger thing that's going on so yeah actually that i covered a case earlier this year crystal mcdowell and her her killer tried to do that failed but tried to to make it look like she disappeared due to hurricane harvey right so there you go there's there's an instance there again it'd be very hard to if he was already planning this and on the 10th when she disappeared because again we don't know where she went after the department store yeah we don't know where those bags are so it's, mm-hmm. it's weird that nobody's come forward if she did go and stay the night somewhere with somebody wouldn't have someone have come forward and be like oh yeah sneha came to my house stayed the night with me she left her bags here and yeah no it's it's because it's like strange. there's just a lot of like what the hell happened there's yeah. no there's nothing yeah. there and it's like the attacks happened the following morning, but there's still a stretch of time from six, six ish when she was last seen to eight forty six a.m. when the nine eleven attacks occurred. So what happened from that period to that period? And there's there's just this, this huge gap there. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, Ron did come home at midnight that night. He was working, and mm-hmm. I assume the police did the very minimum and like made sure he had an alibi and they checked out. To make sure that he was actually there but we don't know for yeah. sure is what i'm saying yeah we don't especially it does leave open with all of this going on like probably very they could know, have just been like chaotic, we don't have the resources thorough. to in- investigate mm-hmm. this missing persons case mm-hmm. you guys live two blocks from the world trade center so we're just gonna lump just we're gonna assume that she was there or was walking around outside when the towers came down and that's how she died which is a very very real possibility i think is the higher uh, percentage possibility here but I do think it doesn't close the window completely that something else happened to her and possibly Ron is is somehow involved because it does seem like based on what what we've talked about that there was something going on in their relationship maybe though that's all very very foggy it is it is foggy but that's why it's hard for me to to lean into that at all. Because I mean, obviously, I don't want to believe that either. But I do see what you're saying. It is it is a possibility. It is a possibility. We just don't know. And I mean, you can't go like full in on that theory and be like, that's what happened because we don't know. And there's we don't know the extent of the investigation that was done. I just don't think you can completely close the the window of that being a possibility because Ron. You know, we don't know exactly what happened after Ron got home. He said he went to bed. But I mean, just I'm just comparing this to other cases where yeah. people who do kill their significant others say the exact same things. They just like, oh, it was a normal night. I came home, went to bed. Yeah. And then, mm-hmm. you know, she just never came home. And could he, you know, could he have set something up? And then when 9-11 did happen, he went kind of the perfect hard happened. in that direction yeah. to try and use it to cover it up. And then... He but at first, he he was against. He thought something else had happened to her. So why, if that was his plan, right, you know, but, he's but, he's saying that that couldn't have been what happened. And people do that all the time. Now you and I both know. I know, I know. that I just don't significant want to believe that. significant others will be like, oh yeah, that she was probably kidnapped. She was probably hit by a car. But to me, neither of those scenarios really make make much sense because there would be some record of her if she was hit by a car they would have found her they would have there would be some record that she was taken by ambulance to the hospital to be treated for her injury she wouldn't have just disappeared from the face of the maybe, earth i mean maybe with 9 11 happening the next day that could you can't rule that out completely but, i don't know i see what you're saying there is a possibility 
And Again, I'm sure just some playing devil's advocate, with, saying yeah. that there is a possibility. I don't think you can completely close that possibility with the information that we have. Or the idea that someone else did something to her. Or she was just out. Just, Crime of opportunity mm -hmm. happened, and it right. just happened by coincidence that 9-11 attacks were the next day, and that person, whoever took her or murdered her or whatever happened to her, just has never been caught because the police weren't able to investigate it adequately. Right. In a world full of subscriptions, we all have them. It seems like no matter what you sign up for these days, it's a subscription model, so it's very easy to lose track of what you're paying for. But thanks to Rocket Money, they've made it extremely easy to track those subscriptions that I've forgotten about. And when I used Rocket Money, I discovered that I was paying two iCloud subscriptions for some reason. So I was able to get the other one canceled with the push of a button thanks to Rocket Money. Rocket Money is truly one of my favorite apps. I use it, I pay for the premium version of it because it is the best personal finance app that I've ever used. And I'm not just saying that, I absolutely love Rocket Money. I use it every single day. If you're not familiar with Rocket Money, it is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and even helps you lower your bills, which makes it truly unique. I'm able to see all my subscriptions in one place. I can track my spending across all my accounts. That includes bank accounts, credit cards, you name it. I'm able to track it. it. Sends me notifications to my phone and my email when a bill goes up or down. It also sends me notifications when I've reached my spending limits for certain things. What's great is they'll even try to get you a refund for the last couple of months of wasted money for those subscriptions you don't want. And they can even help negotiate a lower cost for your bills by up to 20%. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash mile higher. That's rocketmoney.com slash mile higher. Check it out today at rocketmoney.com slash mile higher. And in my mind, that seems more likely than Ron being involved. But above all else, in my opinion, I think the most likely scenario here, especially because... Well, there's she that was, footage too. Yes, there's that footage. And she was known to be such a kind person, loved helping others. And she was a doctor. You know, it's right. like natural instinct. So I think that there's a good chance that she did go to the mall that day or to that restaurant, Windows on the World. Like she told her mom, she did tell her mom that and that she just happened to be there and went to go help people. And so many people lost their lives trying to help people on absolutely. the ground. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And even to this day, there's so many people that have been unidentified from 9-11. Um, it says, despite the advancements in DNA technology, roughly 40% of the victims or about 1,100 people thought to have died in the disaster remain unidentified. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge amount of people. I just like as much as that theory is possible that Ron could be involved or someone else. I think it is far, far more likely that she was a victim of 9-11. Definitely. And I think it's also possible she went to the department store. She bought those things. She bought lingerie and stuff. Is it out of the realm of possibility that that night she was going to have a rendezvous with somebody? You know, she was hanging out with a lot of women. There was... You know, maybe talk of her potentially being bisexual was she having an affair was she seeing somebody mm -hmm. outside of the relationship and that's where she went that night and that person doesn't want to come forward because it exposes them yeah and that's Could why be. on that footage the woman is seen wearing similar clothing to what sneha was wearing but not carrying bags because it's like what to me it's like what happened to the bags mm -hmm. from 6 p.m to that person showing up the next, you know, the next day or whatever. But anything could have the happened. Bags the bags are gone. They could have been stolen. I mean, she's in New York. True, true. But it seems like she went somewhere and somebody had to have interacted with her in some way. Mm -hmm. And so how come nobody's come forward to, to reveal that information unless something... Well, I think with all, with all the on. chaos that... Probably a lot of people who may have come in contact with her forgot about it or were just overwhelmed by everything else going on that they didn't even know that she was missing before, you know, and it got out there that she was a victim of 9-11. That's what was reported at first. So, 
I'm sure there weren't people looking at her photo thinking, oh, did I see her? Could she, you know, I don't know. It's so difficult. Obviously, there's the idea, too, that she purposely left like and faked used, her disappearance, faked her disappearance, um, which, in my opinion, is unlikely, especially because she didn't take anything important with her, like her driver's license or passport or even her eyeglasses or contacts I mean nothing. So personally, I don't I don't believe that at all. But could she have been trying to get out of this relationship with Ron? She could have been. She was. That's what's hard about this case is really anything could have happened. And 9-11 just makes it so much more complicated. Mm -hmm. I don't know. In my opinion, I just, I really think that she went to go help people. And I had no idea that the towers were going to collapse. Yeah. You know, she ran out hearing people injured or, you know, seeing what happened and, and didn't realize the situation that she was in. That's just... That's just my opinion. I think the proximity of their house and where she was last seen. Their apartment. I mean, there are two blocks from right the World there. Trade Center. So right there. when those towers came down, I mean, that that area for a long ways was completely devastated. Mm -hmm. So was she in the towers? Did she end up going into the towers and her remains just haven't been identified yet? Or was she you know, s struck by debris as the towers came down. And, but I feel like in that case, maybe they would have found her remains a little bit easier as opposed to being somebody who's in the towers. Mm -hmm. I think that's just a big, big question mark. And like Janelle said, there's still 40% of the, the victims that are unidentified and they're slowly, but surely year after year, I think like 2021 or 2020, they, they were able to identify like two people. 2021. Yeah. And when, when Those I was, most recent identifications. What's crazy too is that in an article I read, they're identifying people from remains that are as small. Bone fragments. Yeah, fragments as small as Tic Tacs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have like, it's very, very difficult to do. So it's, I think it is very possible that she may have been one of those unidentified victims and hopefully one day they're able to make a positive identification for Sneha's family's sake, obviously. Yeah, I mean, according I so to too. New York City's Office of um, Chief Medical Examiner, this was the largest or is considered the largest and most complex forensic investigation in U.S. history, which makes sense. Cool. So I think there's a high possibility that this is what happened and we just haven't, you know, yeah. confirmed yeah. it. Yeah, because I feel like there would be something else. There'd mm -hmm. be some other trace evidence found to suggest that she had been kidnapped or murdered mm -hmm. or Ron has anything to do with it. Yeah. I there would have been something else. I think in my opinion though, obviously I most lean towards the idea of her being a victim of the attacks. But part of me does think like secondary to that. I think, I think maybe she really could have staged her own disappearance. That's very difficult to do. I know it is very difficult to do. But if you think about all the problems that she was having in her life and, you know, she was possibly, I mean, she's married, but there's a, a chance that she was having other. She was dealing with depression. Mm -hmm. She was mm -hmm. self-medicating with alcohol and she was experimenting with her sexuality. Yeah, most likely having issues at work. She, you know, everything going on in court. Do you so, think it's possible she wasn't planning to necessarily do it, but knew like she wasn't happy in her life. And then 9-11 happened and she was like, oh my gosh, this is my chance. And spur of yeah. the moment decided to try and disappear. Or she was with someone on the night of the 10th, not wanting to go back to her life, like contemplating things. And then this happened and it was kind of the perfect opportunity. Again, I'm not saying I believe that, but, that is but it's, so it's more to likely to me than something else happening to her on the 10th. Really? Yeah. I think statistically that well, I think doesn't it, make sense. Yes, it's but, hard to pull off, but people pull it off all the time. And with 9-11, it makes how? it way how do they easier. Pull it off? Well, when there's... It, I mean, it happens. You know it happens. We've covered plenty of cases. Change their whole identity and yes. there's no sightings of her? Dude, it happens. It happens. I've covered cases where it happens. And she's just like living a life as an artist or something? Yeah, or and then, I mean, people go back to that postcard. She gave up her entire medical career? I don't know that she postcard thing. I'm not, I know. I'm like, eh. I know. That's I'm just stretch. entertaining the idea because, yes, like I said, it's like 
my se- it would be my secondary um, closest theory. But I do think it's possible, especially with 9-11 happening and all the chaos and not having a proper investigation. It would be a lot easier to stage her disappearance in that case. And she'd have more time to think it through. And- my thing is like, if she, if she she to me it seems like she was going somewhere on September 10th. She was shopping for something. She was going somewhere afterwards. It wasn't home. She was going somewhere likely to see somebody, and she was somebody who stayed out very late at night. What are the chances that she was like up early the next morning and was like, you know, running into the the buildings to to render aid? You know what I mean? Like after a late night out and stuff. Like, well, who knows? Maybe she where she get go? Home before... How she get back? And when know. that happened, I don't know. Like some of the logistics are, are fuzzy. But. Yeah. I mean, above all else, I think, I think she was, she was trying to help people and she was a victim of the attacks, which is just heartbreaking. There were so many people who lost their lives just trying to help others. It's, it's so fucking sad to think about. But anyway, of course we want to know what you all think. So let us know in the comments or head over to the mile higher podcast, Instagram, which is mile higher pod. And let us know what you think is most likely in your opinion. But that is going to be it for us today. And we'll um, see you next week. Yeah, we'll see you next week. But until then, keep on taking your mind a mile mile higher. higher.